Turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude. Jude and verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this. Jude verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. It's just one of the most interesting verses to me in the entire Bible. A solemn idea that the people God saved by miracle, that a short time later he destroyed those same people. But we're looking at this verse because of the first part of it. Why is it that Jude would remind us of something that we already know? During during the session, I'm going to talk to you about God's purpose in giving us an imagination. By an imagination, I mean the part of your mind that allows you to think about things that aren't immediately near you. Your ability to solve problems while you're laying in bed. Your ability to think about the second coming of Jesus or about what's going on in the sanctuary. Your ability to even consider the cross. That is what the imagination was given for. And when the imagination becomes ill, when it is diseased, it leads to so many uh, problems. Anyway, that's our subject, and we're going to start right here in verse 5, considering that the imagination needs to be put on ideas that we already know. Let me just show this to you again more clearly. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, we're starting with a few verses about the proper use of the imagination, and then we'll consider something about the diseases of the imagination. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. Look at that verse 1 for a minute. The gospel Paul is preaching, has he preached it to Corinth before? What do you see in verse 1? Has he preached it before? He says he has. And when he preached it the first time, did they accept it the first time? The verse says they did. And when they accepted it the first time, how are they doing now? Have they become washy? Are they fading? Or are they still doing well? They're standing in the gospel that he preached to them. Then why, Paul, are you going to preach the gospel to them again? Verse 2. By which also you are saved, if you keep in mind or in memory what I preached unto you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Is it possible that a belief in the gospel could be vain or useless? It's possible. And Paul said that the gospel I preach to you will save you if it keeps your attention. If it has your attention, it can do its work. If it doesn't have your attention, it isn't affecting you the way it needs to to save you. Let me say this so simply. I know that Jesus died, that he suffered for my sin. When I think about that, it softens my heart It leads me to repentance. It makes me less inclined to treat you in a vindictive way. That's when I think about it. When I'm not thinking about it, that knowledge has very little effect on my character. That is, if I go for the next month and I'm just preoccupied with other things and I think little or none about Jesus, the fact that I know those things, that I would get them right on a quiz... That fact doesn't do much for my character. Do you see here in these two verses when the gospel has the power to change me? By which you are saved if you keep in memory. The if there is what we're talking about. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter 1, and I'm looking at verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. 
according as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But how? Through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. Look at those two verses, 2 Peter 1, verse 2 and 3. How do I get everything that pertains to life and godliness? That's through the knowledge of Jesus, through a knowledge of him that is calling me to glory, to virtue. With that in mind, look all the way down to verse 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. According to Peter, he would be a negligent preacher if he did not continually remind you of some things. Is it because you don't know them? Though you, what does it say? Though you know them. Peter says, I'm going to remind you of things continuously even though you already know them. Is it because you're shaky? He says, though you know them and be what? Established in the present truth. Peter says, I would be negligent if I don't remind you of things continuously that you already know and wherein you are well established. Verse 13, indeed, I think it appropriate as long as I'm in this tabernacle, that is in the body, to stir, up your, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. What Peter is saying is the same thing that Jude implied and that Paul said. And that is, truth stirs us up, it moves us, it changes us when it has our attention. And when truth doesn't have our attention, it fails to have a significant impact on us. I would be willing to take another 40 minutes and develop that idea biblically much further. I'm just not going to because I want to share some other things with you. But let me just give you a practical idea of what it means. If I think back to the story of the flood and I imagine the boat there on the water and people still swimming outside, imagining a scene that undoubtedly is real and true that really happened allows me to be affected by those facts even though I wasn't there in person. If I think about in the judgment right now the son before the father pleading my blood in some cases, but in other cases offering no such defense of the soul. And I see cases being decided for salvation or for loss. When I think about that, wow, that affects me. It makes what I do here seem serious. It gives me reason to study and to try to understand. Thinking to visualize those things has an impact on me. If I just forget about them, the truth has no such impact. So God gave us an imagination for such useful things. Our imagination, that part of our mind that allows us to visualize what's distant, was given to make truth available to us, even though we live in such a small part of Earth's history, in such a small part of Earth's surface, I can be affected by the needs of India. I can be affected by the disaster that went on in Oklahoma. I can have, I can be benefited almost as if I was omnipresent in time and place by things I need to be if I set my mind on that reality. What a long sentence for a simple idea. The, the mind was designed to be a tool to be used by the will where you put your thoughts where you want them to go. Frankly, that is what a healthy imagination is like. A healthy imagination is submitted to the will. Have you read this in 2 Corinthians 10 about every thought being brought into captivity, casting down the imaginations? Well, why cast down my imaginations? It's because the imagination, when diseased, is out of control. It goes on its own little journeys. And in fact, it's possible for your imagination to, even in a sermon like this or a lecture, to be wandering and going somewhere else. I've had a very active imagination. And, and many times, while people are speaking, my mind has been on its own little trip. 
God never intended for your imagination to be out of control of the will. He intended that your will would have control of your imagination. That is, your thoughts would be brought into captivity to obedience. Obedience to Jesus, but Jesus works through your will. That's the healthy use. The unhealthy use is when the mind goes its own way. How about a simple practical application for those who just can't stand theoretical ideas? The television set is to the imagination what a high-fat diet is to the arteries. I mean, it is a cause of disease. In the imagination, your will is not choosing, I mean, your will is not choosing where your imagination goes. Where the television is involved, someone else is choosing where to guide your imagination. And your imagination, when using that medium, becomes passive to the medium. Can I say that was more simple English? Yes. My mind is just following someone else's thoughts when I'm watching that type of medium. Why, that's exactly what my imagination was not intended to do. God intended that it would be in captivity, but now, well, it is in captivity, but not in captivity to to Jesus. If I'm right about 1 Corinthians uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Peter 1, then I can say authoritatively, I do not want to watch or consider fiction, whether that fiction is in a media format or in a book format, whether it be novels or movies or television program programming, I just want to escape all of those things. I'm not even really speaking right now about the wickedness of content not about immorality or violence or low language. That is another issue worth addressing. I'm speaking of something else, about how to have the mind working properly. So what are some improper ways that the mind works? The imagination. I've described one with media, and that improper means your imagination just follows someone else. But for many people, the imagination, instead of being used to consider truth, is being used to create a variety of fictional understandings. That didn't even sound like English. Worry is fiction. Worry is my effort or my imagination trying to perceive the outcome of troubles. And am I able to perceive the outcome of troubles? I cannot effectively perceive the outcome of troubles. And when my imagination goes in that direction, my worry is blind, it cannot discern the future. Jesus, of course, can see the future. He has a thousand ways to take care of me, of which I don't know a single thing. But when my imagination goes into that realm, it becomes ill. And probably you know persons, you might even be people. You probably know persons whose lives are oppressed, their minds are unhealthy by reason of worry. By thinking about what's coming, imagining something disastrous on the horizon, when that kind of imagination becomes, or that kind of disease becomes prominent, we call it paranoia. But probably paranoia is not the first step of the illness. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Jesus talked about an unhealthy use of the imagination when he said, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. That is, my imagination could be placed in looking at in trying to get through that barrier of modesty that clothing provides. That use of my imagination, of course, brings me into a deep, corrupted, low... How can I say what that does to my character? Probably I don't need to say it because you already understand. But fantasizing and masturbation 
are a disease of the imagination that destroys the character, destroys the, mor the morality. It ruins the spiritual courage of a person. At this point, we're not talking about cures, although I feel like just talking about a cure when I bring up such an issue. But we're talking about diseases of the imagination. The imagination is ill when it is tries to perceive your own value, strength, or health. Let me explain what I mean because that could sound so vague. Many illnesses have such a variety of symptoms that uh, if you're so inclined, you can always think that you probably have cancer. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm trying to say right now? I mean, in terms of little itches and pains and stresses and new, if I'm inclined to it, long before I get to what, what might be called, uh, is it hypochondria? Is, it, is that Long before I get to that level, there is a level of illness of the mind that leads to literal illness of the body. Our lecture, I mean, the title of this convention is Mind Cure 2013. Probably some of you here know about the chapter with that same title, Mind Cure, in the book Ministry of Healing. And what you find in that chapter is that the imagination can make you physically sick. If you imagine that because you had that dessert that you're going to get sick, even as much as that sugar weakens your immune system, you're thinking about that sugar also weakens your immune system. Does that sound like fiction to you? Maybe you don't even believe me. But, uh, and I don't mind if you don't believe me. But frankly, it's true that the mind was never meant, that the imagination was never meant to try to ascertain your wellness based on your feelings or, or a lack of relevant data. I know, look, so if you find a lump or a bulge in some part of your body, you probably should pay special attention to it. I'm not trying to get you to pretend that you're always healthy no matter what. But, but I'm talking about what the, what the imagination does when it becomes ill. How instead of thinking about beautiful truths that change the character, the imagination can be distracted to low and erroneous themes and you be, can begin to think of yourself as sick when you're not. But just as common, there are people who in their thinking and in their imaginary dream life, they imagine themselves being like heroes, like solving disasters. And if a criminal is nearby, they take care of him. And, that, you know, if you wonder where this kind of illness in the imagination comes from, well, of course, that came from media. Don't you see that a thousand times on media? And it produces that same kind of mentality. That is a disease of your imagination, to imagine yourself kind of like the hero. If you're wondering like a source, like am I just making up what I'm saying, let me just lead you to a source. Besides that chapter, Mind Cure, there is a, an old book called Mind, Character, and Personality. And in the, in the two volumes that make up that book, if you will, you'll find a chapter called The Imagination. And I'm just giving you kind of a synopsis of things extracted largely from that source. If you think that no one loves you, that is a disease of your imagination. Can you see inside people's minds and their motives? Can you tell when you're unappreciated? I have just found so many people who feel that they are unappreciated when they are widely appreciated. Well, how could they come to feel that they're unappreciated? Maybe because we don't tell them they're appreciated, but that's not the point I'm going at right now. You can't see people's motives. You can't read their thoughts. You don't know. When people are laughing quietly with some inside thing, the thought that they're laughing at you is, in fact, an ill use of your imagination. So I have a document, and if you will send me an email, I will send you a 
copy of that document. Uh, my email address is memorable. It's canvassing at canvassing.org. I think you could remember that. Canvassing has two S's in it. Canvassing at canvassing.org. The document is called The Faculty of Imagination, and it has quite a list of incredible statements designed to help diagnose diseases of the imagination, and then even inspired help for how to assist someone whose imagination is ill. And now I want to move to uh, the last and most useful section of our consideration of the imagination, and then maybe we'll have time for questions. What can you do for yourself or someone whose imagination is diseased? Turn in your Bibles to Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and looking at verse 6. I hear so few pages turning that I think you don't have Bibles, so I'm going to read it to you. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Verse 6 is a simple antidote to a worry disease. That is, instead of worrying, what, what's the alternative to worrying in verse 6? It's making requests known to God and believing that he will take care. Do you see how that's a very practical solution for worry? Here, worry threatens to, to distract me and to discourage me and to push me down. And what Paul says is, I don't need to worry. I can make requests to God. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Is that what we want in a convention called Mind Cure? Our minds to be kept, peace to be right there? If the end goal is to have peace and a mind that's kept, that's verse 7. The cause is verse 6, and that is a prayer life that is the alternative to the use of worry. Then look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. That is the shortest, most simple verse I know on curing a mat diseases of the imagination. Here's a great irony. The word imaginary has come to be synonymous with fictitious. But that was never the way God intended my imagination to be used. A creative mind need not be placed on the negative and the false supernatural and the strange and the murderous and the immoral it could be placed upon the true, upon the ancient and the future and the distant. When I put my, so back up a step, I'm just guessing that at least half of you in this room are familiar with this idea from Colossians 1 and from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians 3. Frankly, I get them mixed up and don't know which Corinthians 3. But it is the idea that we are changed by the things that we consider. By beholding, we are modified in our character. This idea, so we're, if we consider Jesus, we're changed into the same image from, from, glory, from one level of glory to another. That is, the purpose of the imagination was to be a moral uplift. You find yourself morally weak. You find yourself struggling. Has God given you a tool that's kind of like a jack for your morality? He has. He's given you an imagination that could be placed on wonderful themes. 
You could think about Jesus. You could think about the beautiful things he's made. You could even think about nature and the lessons that you can learn from the self-sacrifice of a, for example, of a um, kill deer that is acting like it's injured to lead you away from its young. By thinking about the lessons in nature, the lessons in the Bible, by considering things that are noble and true and pure, morally you're uplifted. But if you look at verse 8 and think about it here in Philippians 4, you could probably realize that the opposite of verse 8 would lead to an opposite reaction. That by considering things that are lewd and low, things that are false and wrong, that my character receives a hit. I become weaker. So here comes a practical application that if everyone carried it out, it might decimate the attendance at Mind Cure 2014. You ought to move out of the large cities. I don't mean so you can escape persecution. If you live godly in Christ Jesus, you are going to receive persecution. The reason to leave the large cities is not so you can get 40 acres in the middle of nowhere and live off the grid where no one can find you. That's not the reason. It's so you can have a pure mind that's useful for God in reaching the masses. So that 15, 20, 30 miles away from a populated center is a much better place than 400 miles from a post office. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Philippians 4.8 gives ideas about moral help. But let me go to some more specifics. In that book, Mind, Character, and Personality, the author describes the character of God in such a warm way she writes that when God sees a determined effort to place the mind on noble themes, when she sees someone who struggles with immoral thoughts, someone who struggles with masturbation or with, with this kind of fantasizing problems, which would be almost all unregenerate men and very many men who have at one time or another been regenerate, I mean, I don't know anything about how it goes for ladies, but this is a big problem. That when God sees someone with that kind of weakness trying his best to put his mind on noble themes and disciplining himself to keep them there, that God draws that mind to himself like a magnet and purifies the thoughts and enables that mind to be cleansed from all impurity. Isn't that just a beautiful promise? I don't know, but it's in the article I would send you if you sent me an email. It's in the chapter I made a reference to, which is somewhere in the book I talked about. What an amazing idea that the imagination, if God sees you trying to use it properly, he will add divine power to your human effort. You know this is a secret of moral success, the union of human effort and divine power. An appropriate therapy for someone with the diseased imagination would be to spend time outdoors in a beautiful, natural setting. Frankly, just being surrounded, when we read in Philippians 4 8, what sort of things are true and honest and pure and lovely? You can't find a better description of a national park. It's just a place to go and be where the mind can be surrounded by thoughts that uplift and ennoble. I live about four miles from a, uh, a city with 10,000 people where we're doing church planting, my wife and I. And when I, I spoke last Friday at a graduation, when I came home and drove into the parking lot of my house, I saw a raccoon, and, and frankly, my headlights treed the raccoon. You know, he went right up a tree beside the driveway, and I was able to show my nephews the raccoon, the tail anyway. You could see the tail up there. And then we went a little further, and there was a, um, a spotted sandpiper that had been uh, attacked by an owl, but had survived, but with an injured wing, 
and we were able to capture that spotted sandpiper, and my nephews could see it and hold it. And I'm just trying to describe for you just a picture of, of the way my mind was made to work. My mind was created to be situated in a garden and there to commune with God and there to be ennobled and strengthened. That works. It was, that was God's original plan, right? You see that in Genesis? When you pull that mind out and put it somewhere else, in a concrete jungle, if you will, surrounded with sounds and sights of danger and excitement and stimulation, you create a, an atmosphere where the mind is not morally functioning the way you want it to be functioning. I'll even go further there. My mind is designed to help me have sympathy for you. If I know one of you personally and I find out that you've been diagnosed with cancer, it will hurt me. I will feel for you. And if my neighbors, if they end up having their dog be hit by a car, I'll feel badly for them and I can show sympathy for them, even though I didn't witness the event happen. My imagination was designed to help me sympathize with the needs of people who aren't right in my vicinity. But imagine this, if I can be bombarded with needs that are far away from me and that are beyond my ability to help, I could be exposed to so much need that it just deadens my ability to react. This is why I don't think it's a good idea for you to watch the news, even if it's all true. But today, I don't think you could even say it's all true. But just say it was all true. It's possible for you to see on the news more disaster than you can appropriately react to. And if in doing that, you deaden your ability to respond to the local needs, if you find yourself seemingly untouched by the atonement, if your heart isn't, isn't grabbed by the sacrifice of Jesus or a consideration of the judgment, You've been deadened by something. And if you have been deadened, then your imagination has lost some of its ability to help you. It is ill, and a proper nourishing environment would provide a good a situation for healing, and a, you understand. That's good, because I can't think of how to say it any better. If you know someone whose imagination is diseased, even someone who is schizophrenic, I've had several schizophrenic students. I never intended to study schizophrenia. I never have really studied it. So to those of you who out here who know what that's about, and I, if I say something foolish, at least I told everyone that I never studied it, right? <laughs> but here is what I have observed. Give one of those students a a room and a bed where they can just spend a lot of time thinking and their symptoms get worse and worse and worse until they are out of control. But take that same man and give him a non-repetitive job, one that requires the engagement of his mind with his hand. That is something like gardening and where he has to do something and his symptoms just go down, down, down until he begins to seem something like a rational person. Why, I watched it before I thought about it, but after I thought about it, it really made sense. Does it make any sense to you? That the imagination wants to escape and be out of control, and people sometimes make an imaginary land for themselves that's kind of more comforting than the pains of real life. But God intended that real life would prevent me from the overuse of my imagination, even to just rehearse and think about the pains that I experience or that have happened to me. A, a rehearsing of those pains is not a proper use of my imagination. I don't mean there's never a place for thinking about your past, but I, you, I think you understand what I mean. By going over and over and over, you could create your own post-traumatic stress syndrome. 
remember, I don't know what I'm talking about. Finally, Isaiah 58. Turn there with me. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58 has the most precious promises found anywhere in Scripture. Promises, for example, look at verse 11. The Lord will guide you how much? Continually. He'll satisfy your soul. He will make your bones healthy. You'll be like a watered garden, like a spring. Your children will end up fixing things instead of ruining them spiritually. Do you see that in verse 12? They that be of thee. Look at verse 10. If you draw out your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light will rise in obscurity and your darkness will be as the noonday. If I could, verse 9, you will call and the Lord will answer. The diseased imagination responds so well to the work of selfless service. And if you will put yourself out to help your neighbors, to give needy people assistance, to find persons and share the little bit God has shared with you, if you will break off your sins by righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, that's Daniel 4.27, if you'll put yourself out for someone else, that's what your mind was given to you for. You were, your face was not even given to you for the purpose of self-expression. It was given to you for the purpose of service. Let me try to say that simply. Here's my hand. I'm very busy and in a hurry, and I see an old lady struggling with something heavy. I don't have time to help her, but I ought to help her anyway. And so I go over and I pick up that heavy bag and I carry it for her a certain distance, and I've helped her. Was it hypocritical to help her? Of course not. I was just putting her needs ahead of my own needs. You can see that my hand wasn't given me for myself. It was given to me for others. But what's true about my hand is true about my face. My face isn't to express my imagination, my sadness. My, uh, you, what you need for me is courage and energy. Often what you need is encouragement. And if I'll learn to use my face in service the way I use my hand, there's nothing hypocritical about smiling at someone while you're hurt. Jesus was acquainted with sorrows, but he had a cheerful disposition. That is because his face wasn't for self-expression so much as it was for service. I'm trying to talk about Isaiah 58 in a practical way. Is the imagination diseased in North America? Heavily diseased. Our imaginations are runaway. They are ill. They think about worry. They think about ourselves as super. They think about ourselves as smart or stupid. They think about ourselves as sick when we're not. Our imaginations are frankly diseased. Is there a cure? There is, and it has much to do with the power of the will. Discipline in your mind to put your thoughts on noble themes, things like nature, on the atonement, on the past and the present, on the needs of your neighbors, things that, needs that you can interact with, when you put your mind on things that are holy and true and of good report and avoid those things that lead your imagination astray, like the television, the media, the novels, if you'll give yourself an agent or a program like this, your imagination will slowly heal the way your arteries would heal and you can become a healthy-minded person, one whose mind is brought into captivity to Jesus whose thoughts are in appropriate obedience, one for whom sanctification works the way God intended, the truth will sanctify because finally it'll have the attention and God can finish what he has started. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Our Father in heaven, I ask that you would take care of us, that you'd find a way to finish what you've started, that you would save us from the disaster of a malfunctioning mind, that you would give us those promises of Isaiah 58, that you would answer when we call, that you would turn our darkness to day, that you'd cause our health to spring forth speedily, that you'd turn, uh, turn towards us and allow us to experience the joy of the Lord. 
Shall each one hear a practical way to meet the needs of someone else? And I ask for these gifts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.